Great. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Rahul. Uh, I am opened my lab about a year and a half ago. Um, I'm a core member at the New York Genome Center and also an assistant professor in the biology department of New York at NYU. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, how my lab has been using the mantis uh, for about the last year in a very similar way uh, to what Maggie was just talking about to try to develop a very high throughput, fully automated and low cost pipeline that I seek. And I've included this, this picture here. It's a little bit of a joke, but it's, it's true. Actually, when I opened my lab in October of 2014, the mantis uh, was our very first piece of equipment. Uh, we knew this was, was how we wanted to center our workflow. And uh, so the very first piece of equipment we ever had in the lab was the Mantis, which came with this uh, uh, very helpful uh, box of food coloring. So we, we basically spent a lot of our first week just, just pipetting out food coloring because that was all we had. But it, <laughs> uh, the Mantis has worked out extremely well for us even since then. I'm, I'm happy to tell, uh, tell you guys about what, what we've been using it for. Um, and uh, See if I can get this to advance. There we go. So, um, uh, as Maggie was talking about, we've really been using uh, my lab is very, very focused on on single cell uh, genomics, in particular single cell RNA seq. And we got interested in this uh, not that long ago. Our, our first paper on this uh, came out in about 2013. And what I'm showing you here are data, this is far before we used the mantis, we prepared data from 18 single cells. These are the IGV screenshots, and, and blue are single cells, and our red are our three population controls. It wasn't that long ago, but this was actually with the CloneTech V1 kit, so, so from, <laughs> from the, the ancient days of CloneTech before all the, the new improvements. But this was our, these were our very first CloneTech experiments, and we, we ran CloneTech V1 on 18 single cells, followed by just traditional library preparation, uh, just uh, not And that cost us about $200 per cell, which is why we really only ran 18 of them. But even with 18 cells, we, we could see something very exciting. These were immune cells that we stimulated in culture, and right away we could see that the, the housekeeping genes, the highly expressed housekeeping genes, were identical. They were expressed at almost identical levels across all the single cells, but the immune response genes were fluctuating enormously and implying enormous cellular heterogeneity and immune response. And that's what got us first interested in single cell technology. And I'm obviously not going to go into the details of this, but what was really exciting to us, even with just 18 cells, we saw this big thousand-fold, in some cases, from cell to cell in terms of key immune response genes. It wasn't just that cells were randomly activating particular genes. It was that entire clusters of genes were being co-activated in subsets of cells. And basically what that was telling us was that cellular heterogeneity wasn't just random and, and, and um, stochastic, but there was actually information that we could learn from this. And it was amazing to us that we were able to do this with just 18 cells. Uh, but of course, we instantly realized that this technology we wanted to start thinking not about 18 cells, but about hundreds and even thousands of cells uh, to really come to attack very, very complex biological problems, not only in a cell culture dish, but eventually moving uh, in vivo. And so we were thinking very heavily as I opened my lab and as I was finishing my postdoc at the Broad Institute for how, you know, what are the, the limitations, what are the challenges for being able to do sort of really high throughput, low cost uh, single cell genomics? And, and the first limitation really is cost. Because um, you know, we, we can maybe learn something from 10 or 20 cells, but we needed to think about workflows to enable us to routinely profile hundreds to even thousands of cells, not just tens of cells. Uh, and, and one of the sort of really interesting things that came out of, and, and multiple groups have found over the past few years, is that you don't need to sequence a single cell very deeply. You certainly don't need to sequence it as deeply as you do a traditional RNA-seq experiment. Uh, and so that, what that means is that the cost of a single cell RNA-seq experiment is primarily in the library prep, or at least traditionally was in the library prep, not in the sequencing. So if we could find ways to make cheap libraries, that would really enable us to increase our scale. But even if we could make cheap libraries with a cheap protocol, if we're thinking about doing hundreds or thousands of cells, we need ways to be able to do molecular biology in extremely high throughput. We needed really, really high throughput workflows to be able to get to this kind of scale. And one of the things that we rapidly ran into as we started to try to build these, these workflows, it's not just the Nextera or the reverse transcription or the PCR that has to be high throughput. Every step has to be high throughput. And sometimes some of these QC steps, uh, if they're essential, if they're more time consuming or costly than the experiment itself, 
then we need to find ways to make those efficient as well, not just the, the molecular biology. And of course, we wanted uh, workflows that were highly reproducible. We wanted to be able to have accurate pipetting at low volume, and we wanted to be able to minimize uh, human input, especially as I started to think about building a lab primarily with new graduate students. So, I think I'm just going to advance here. Sorry, I I'm, I'm, seems to be stuck on this slide. There we go. Okay, so if you think about sort of, you know, what is our, our, our wish list here for a fully automated pipeline? What are some of the things that we need to, to, to be um, For sure, we want to be able to reduce our manual labor. Uh, we want to be able to work with low reagent costs, and that not only means having reactions in small volumes, but it also means having a very low dead volume. Uh, and we want to minimize our cost on things like consumables, which can add up quite a bit under, under standard workflows. And lastly, we want you know, high flexibility. So what I'm showing you here is our old, when I was a postdoc before our Mantis days, we had a Bravo at the Broad Institute, and I think the Bravo is a, a wonderful machine and uh, still plays an important part in our pipeline. Uh, but we've been able to really augment that uh, with the addition of the Mantis and the Neural Genome Center, and really allows us to hit a lot of these things on our wish list, which I'll go through uh, a little bit now. So. We really benefit from a few major uh, features of the Mantis that have been reviewed a few times. The first is that we can add to multiple wells from a single source. So we can make master mix once and distribute the same amount of master mix to many, many, many different wells across multiple plates uh, and do that in an automated way. So this ability to do single source addition is something that we really benefit from from the Mantis. Of course, we can scale that down to very low volumes as well, and we've had a great success with the low volume pipetting with the Mantis. And I'll talk in the end about how the fact that we can do programmable adding, how we can add different amounts of liquid to each well, actually really enables a very creative uh, workaround for high throughput QC and normalization. So if we just think about this briefly, you know, before we had the Mantis, you know, how would we do um, how would we do a 96 well plate of single cell RNA seq? Well, we'd have to make our single master mix for every molecular reaction. We'd have to aliquot that master mix probably into a 12-well strip tube or something uh, with a high dead volume, 20 to 30 percent. Then we'd have to use a multi-channel to continually aspirate and dispense and mix uh, from, the, from the source strip uh, to different rows or columns of our 96-well plate, having to do that potentially up to 32 times for a 384-well plate. Uh, so it's a lot of pipetting, and we have to go through a, a different pipette tip uh, for every sample. So the tips start to add up and become very, very costly. So these non-automated non methods can become very laborious and wasteful. But when we do molecular biology now with the mantis, we have a much more simplified workflow. We simply make the master mix once. And this is actually most of what we use the mantis for, and it's what Maddie was referring to as well. We simply distribute low amounts of master mix to every single well in the exact same volume. And this is wonderful because it requires very little human pipetting. Uh, we rely on the low volume pipetting and the accuracy of the mantis, and we simply go through a single tip uh, for every single dispense rather than a single tip per sample. Uh, and all of those things are really quite valuable for us and enable us to really have uh, much uh, cheaper costs for our molecular biology. And as Maggie was referring to, the other thing that we can really do here is we can really miniaturize our reactions using the low volume pipetting of the mantis. So traditionally, we've just, just as, uh, as Maggie described, we've scaled our reverse transcription reactions down to about 25% of the original volume. The next Terra library prep costs, which are actually particularly expensive, we scaled those down by a factor of 16 with the mantis and, and really, really cut our heavily that way. Uh, and that's, that's enabled a significant cost savings and an increase in scale. Uh, so all of that is, is um, uh, relatively straightforward. You know, we can use the Mantis to, 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 to distribute master mix to many wells and to lower our reaction volumes. But one of the really cool ways that we've used the Mantis, and maybe something that's interesting to talk about, is what do you do after you've made your amplified cDNA from the Smarter kit? So for those of you that have done a lot of clone tech or a lot of Smarter, you know that there's a lot of variability from well to well in terms of what comes out with single cell inputs. So some wells might return a very high uh, amount of cDNA and some wells might return absolutely no cDNA at all. And you need to, in order for the next Terra to work, you need to be able to normalize each of those cDNAs to the same input. Uh, and so, um, you know, typically we, we, you know, we used to do that by hand. So you would run individual qubit reactions on every single one, or maybe a pico green on every single one of your wells. And then you would normalize by hand, one at a time, each of the individual tubes uh, down to you know the required amount of cDNA that uses input to Nextera. 
so that was one problem. And you also have to do QC on every well because um, not 100% of the wells succeed. As, as Maggie showed, you often get a failure rate of up to even 50% with your single cell RNA-seq experiments. You want to make sure that you don't waste money uh, making libraries on those experiments going forward. And, and so the manual way to, to get around this fact and not waste money on failed experiments is just to take the, the cDNAs that worked and move them to a new plate prior to doing Nextera. That way they're all next to each other and you can do multi-channeling. But that's, pretty, that's also pretty time consuming and slow. And so the lazy manual way, which is what we used to do when I was a postdoc, was we just we skipped the QC. It, was too, it took too long and it was too costly. So we just normalized everything down to the same amount, hoping that it would roughly turn out roughly okay. And we just made libraries from everything. And it was an enormous uh, cost uh, waste because we were not making the most out of our cDNA. But to actually do individual QC on hundreds to thousands of wells was simply going to be uh, not possible. So what we've done uh, uh, now is a, is a three-step QC profile that uses the Mantis very heavily that I think is, might be uh, interesting for some of you guys to hear about. So the very first thing we do is we, we don't do individual qubits for sure. We, we do a picogreen assay and we use the Mantis to aliquot out picogreen reagent uh, to, to identify the cDNA yield from every single one of our wells. And you can see there's quite a large range here. Some of the wells uh, incur extremely high cDNA yields. These, might even, these guys might even be doublets or can, can, uh, multiple cells that were deposited by the facts. But even within the successes, there is a very, very wide range here in terms of, of yields. Uh, and then we see only a couple cells here that had very, very low yields and that we want to exclude going forward. But sometimes the percentage is much higher. We can see in some plates up to 50% of, of wells don't give a good reaction. And that might have nothing to do with the molecular biology. They might just be dead cells. The question is, you know, how are we going to normalize these guys to the same uh, uh, inputs for Nextera and also not waste money on these failed experiments. And so here we use this really cool feature of the Mantis where we can add different amounts of reagent to each well. To use that Excel, we have a little script that takes our picogreen uh, assay and says how much water do I need to add to each well in order to normalize this down to 0.15 or whatever our, our target is in terms of cDNA yield. Uh, and we simply just add that into, a, uh, into an Excel file and automatically import that into the Mantis. And now we have what we call a mask, where the Mantis is going to add different amounts of water to every well. And at the end of this procedure, we should have very, very tightly normalized uh, cDNA pools, which is a really a high throughput way for us to be able to get every well down to the same amount. Now, in this particular plate, we add zero. We don't, we don't waste time adding water to the wells that failed. You can see there are a number of wells here where we add zero. That's because those wells didn't return any cDNA. So um, you know, now when we think about doing Nextera, how are we wasting Nextera failed wells? And so now what we do is actually when we, when we add, uh, when we run Nextera, we use this sort of same idea. We only add Nextera reagent to the wells that were successful. And the wells that weren't successful, we simply don't add Nextera reagent to. So we don't waste, um, we don't waste any money. We call this a mask. We use the picogreens to tell us which well should we proceed forward with. And if the well isn't worth proceeding forward with, we simply don't um, have to deal with it. And this is really high throughput because we don't, we just make a little bit less master mix. We don't have to tell a human head into A1, but not A2. We just make master mix only for the successful reactions, and then the mantis just skips over the failed well. So it's a really nice way for us to be able to, to make the most out of our next terror reagent, which is really where our money goes. Uh, and then I, I won't show as much QC data because I think Maggie showed a lot of sequencing and QC data, but, but I'll just say that you know when we do technical replicates, for example, of, of universal like human RNA, this is 50 picogram replicates uh, and a negative control in well 11, we see extraordinary uh, uniformity uh, and reproducibility with the mantis, um, even when we go down to these very, very small reaction volumes. Of course, it never looks this good for a single cell because there's differences size and the RNA content of different cells, uh, but we have uh, often seen very, very high success rates across our plate, which speaks to the reproducibility of this workflow. Uh, and so I'm not going to tell any biological stories today. That's, that's uh, not the purpose of this webinar, but I will just say that, that these things in parallel have allowed us to have a combined workflow for fully automated single cell RNA sequencing, which is really our goal, to be able to look across diverse uh, systems, whether it's in vitro stem cells that we're differentiating into neurons. Uh, in cell culture, whether it's looking at an entire animal in early development, we see enormous cellular heterogeneity, or to look at things like T cells and autoimmune disease, we've leveraged this pipeline to the point where we're no longer looking at 10 or 20 or 18 cells, we're routinely able to profile hundreds and thousands of cells at vastly reduced costs, and that's, that's been really useful and exciting for my lab. 
Uh, I'll just quickly acknowledge members of my lab, and particularly Ashley Powers, who's, um, who's helped to set up this workflow, uh, and happy to take any questions from you guys. All right, thank you, Raul. So what we'll do now is answer any questions that anybody may have. Uh, we do have a few questions that have come in already. Uh, the first one is to Rahul. Uh, do you see any cross-contamination between samples? Would you mind repeating that? The, the question itself actually cut out. Sure. Uh, the question is, do you see any cross-contamination between samples? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, and it's something that we, was actually one of the reasons why we really like the mantis, because we observed very little splashing. Uh, between wells. So we, we, we assessed contamination in two ways, one of which is more quantitative, I would say, than the other. Uh, we have done sort of species level mixing it, put a human cell in one well and a mouse cell in another. Essentially no cross-contamination between samples there, which is very exciting. The less, uh, the le less technical way was in the first week of my lab, uh, we would simply um, pipette blue to one well and not pipette and then look to see whether we were getting contamination of this food coloring that uh, formulaetics generally provided. And we never saw, uh, we never saw any contamination there. So we, were, we, we feel pretty good about the, um, the lab from well to well. Okay. Uh, we looks like we have a few questions for you. The next one is, what version of the Smarter Kit was used in your single cell prep? Yeah, so you know, my lab has been doing this for a few years, and, and we've used a variety of molecular biology techniques and so, for example, those very early experiments were done with, with um, Clone Tech V1. Recently, we have a protocol, some of which are Seq2 protocol, which was published a couple of years ago, and now has been integrated into the Clone Tech V4. So it really makes no difference to the workflow. Um, cell technologies uh, have, have advantages and disadvantages, um, but uh, the workflow is quite consistent regardless of a Clone Tech kit. Okay, uh, one more. Are you using the Mantis in a PCR hood for reagent addition or in, on your open lab bench? Yeah, it's a really good question. We traditionally have not done things in a PCR-free environment. I think it's a great that. Uh, the reason we haven't done that is because we, we do have to, for example, subtract sometimes from wells, and so that's where we use other, uh, other automation. Those wouldn't fit in a hood. So the, it would be a great idea to put the Mantis in a hood. We haven't been doing that. Okay, and this one is for Maggie or myself. So are Smarter Seek protocol files for, for the Mantis available to other users? Um, I guess I can feel that one. So the Mantis is a completely open architecture. So as you saw in uh, Rahul's slides, that any well can be, any volume can be dispensed into any well. So essentially, uh, you can either broadcast your reagents uniformly or use a, a simple macro to import uh, Excel list, which will do your normalization and your uh, steps to that point. So while we don't have a essentially a canned protocol, uh, it's very open, and as you can see from some of the screenshots, it's uh, there's not much to do besides tell the mantis what volume you want in each well. So. And to to add to that, I can say that um, you know we're happy to share you know the volumes that we use to scale down, um, and then you know it's very very easy to program. I would like to reiterate that for sure. Okay, well that concludes the questions. So I'd like to thank uh, Rahul Sujita uh, for your time today, uh, as well as Maggie Bostic. Uh, really appreciate the presentation. Again, this has been recorded. Uh, and we'll be distribute this to both uh, the attendees as soon as uh, we wrap up today. So thank you very much.